Hi, Eventfolio voice peeps. Welcome to a super exciting episode sponsored by Hills, where I'm joined by Dr. Alexandra Garrow to discuss the management of canine oral tumors. I say exciting because while oral tumors themselves can be devastating, there's something that I encounter with some degree of regularity because I tend to practice a lot of dentistry and I always end up with a little bit of anxiety over what to do when I see them. You know, do I do an incisional biopsy, excisional, do I take the tooth? There's so many questions that come up when I see these tumors. So what an opportunity to talk to Dr. Garrow and have her walk me through the thought processes when it comes to canine oral tumors and help make sure I'm doing the best thing for my patients. I hope you'll get the same benefit out of our talk and it'll help alleviate some of the questions that arise the next time you encounter an oral tumor. Dr. Garrow is a medical oncology resident at North Carolina State College of Veterinary Medicine. She received her veterinary degree from the University of Montreal and completed a rotating internship in small animal medicine and surgery at Purdue University. Prior to residency, she also completed a fellowship in canine bone marrow transplant and apheresis at NCSU. Dr. Garrow enjoys teaching her passion of oncology to DVM students and feels fortunate to be able to participate in the continuing education of veterinarians and veterinary technicians. If you enjoy this episode, you can find more CE from Dr. Garrow and others on the Hills website, hillsnorthamerica.com. So for this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Alexandra Garrow, who is a medical oncology resident in North Carolina. So Dr. Garrow, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, well, the pleasure is mine. I'm so excited to be part of this podcast series and honestly, like particularly excited to be talking about an oncology related topic today. Yes. And I'm excited that we're talking about oral tumors because I focus a lot of what I do when I am physically in the clinic on dentistry. And so of course, when you really like pulling teeth, then people will send you things like oral tumors and you're like, oh gosh, what do I do with this? Do I have the knowledge to address this correctly? So looking forward to asking all of my burning questions. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) So this is going to sound like an obvious question, but let's just start with where. What are some of the common locations that oral tumors are found in, aside from obviously in the mouth? Yeah, absolutely. That's an excellent question. And I think we have to keep in mind that, you know, in in canine oral tumors, there are both benign and malignant tumors. And You know, they can be found pretty much everywhere in the mouth, whether that means the buccal or the lingual mucosa, the hard palate, the tongue. But there are some tumors that have a predilection for specific locations. And so kind of, you know, if we're starting rostrally, it's a common location for both benign and malignant tumors. Common benign tumors that we'll find rostrally are called peripheral odontogenic fibromas. They were previously referred as epulis. And I think a lot of general practitioners still use this term. They're typically, you know, these POFs, short, localized, firm swellings that appear typically, you know, quiet on oral exam. They are typically covered by a smooth epithelium. They're not necessarily ulcerated or inflamed. They can be solitary or multifocal, so super important when we do an oral exam to look everywhere in the mouth. And these fibromas can also be found in the caudal mandible as well, so rostrally or caudal mandible. And then I think rostrally, another type of benign tumor that we commonly find there is the echinthomatous ameloblastoma. These tumors are benign, but they are pretty impressive in terms of their proliferation and inflammation. So these masses are red, raised, they can be smooth or more cauliflower-like masses most of the time, but they can certainly be very impressive. Obviously, there are other types of, of benign tumors, but those are kind of the two main ones that we can cover today. 
And then in terms of the malignant tumors, those tumors can be found essentially anywhere in the mouth. And so oral exams, you really have to look everywhere, including the tonsils. And that will be especially important for a type of malignant tumor called a squamous cell carcinoma. These tumors are typically rapidly growing pink fleshy masses. They can be ulcerated or not. They can be present rostrally, but obviously they can affect the gingiva, the gums, the oral mucosa, the tongue, and the tonsils. Location for those squamous cell carcinomas will help us predict its behavior. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the podcast in terms of prognosis of those tumors. And then two other types of malignant tumors I wanted to mention today that can also be found, you know, anywhere in the mouth. So oral malignant melanomas, very, very common in dogs. They are pigmented tumors that can affect any portion of the mouth. And that can, again, include gingiva, the oral mucosa, even the tongue. And I think it's important to remember that some of those melanomas, there's an amelanotic version, meaning that they lack pigment. And so they can appear pink or red. So the lack of dark color for an oral mass does not rule out melanoma. And then finally, there's another type one of the most common canine malignant oral tumors, fibrosarcomas. They're typically found caudally in the mouth, and they'll typically be found on the maxilla of dogs. And they appear mostly firm, flat, and then obviously they'll be locally invasive, but we'll touch base on that later. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. That was an excellent description of you know where to look and what we're looking for. And this next question goes into what to do about these masses. And you you mentioned the odontogenic fibromas earlier, or epulis, which yes, I'm guilty. I do still call them epuli sometimes. But but these tumors, I see them and I feel like I can kind of suspect that this is what I'm looking at. Like you said, it's smooth, it's quiet, it's non-ulcerated. And then my internal battle is always like, the tooth underneath looks so good. Do I really go in and and pull this tooth related to this mass that is most likely from the periodontal ligament and going to come back if I don't? So the overall question, one, of course, my own personal question about what do I do when I suspect this odontogenic fibroma? But just in general, for all masses, should do we need to biopsy every mass that we see? Are there times when maybe we shouldn't biopsy and it's contraindicated? And then what do we do about pulling that associated tooth? That is a very good question. It kind of brings up the fact that we talked, I mean, I alluded to benign versus malignant tumors. They can appear very similar clinically. So sometimes they can look very quiet, just kind of based on the appearance, location. But I'd have to say that histopath is very, it's a useful tool. It's mandatory to really be able to differentiate between both. This is where, you know, oral examinations can be extremely important. So regular oral exams can help us identify whether is this a mass that just kind of popped up? Is it new? Hasn't been there before? Is it growing quickly? So I think those are all important things that we'll have to keep in mind. And in terms of benign oral tumors, they typically will progress very slowly, but they can just also look like really bit you know, large or enlargements of the gingiva. And they, benign tumors can cause tooth movement or tooth resorption. And so obviously, if we think that there's an affected tooth, that's the question, are we doing an excisional versus an incisional biopsy? And I'll touch base on that, but biopsies, at least to me, in my professional opinion, we should always biopsy oral tumors. Now, of course, we have to take into consideration patient safety. So does the patient have sufficient platelets or any other evidence of coagulopathies? Is this patient, does it have ITP, so immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, in which case we might not want a biopsy, of course. But I do think that it's very appropriate to do a biopsy prior to a definitive procedure because it can change the client's willingness to treat or the way the pet would be ultimately treated. 
your question about, you know, should I remove this tooth that's involved? It's so I guess the question is, do we do an incisional versus an excisional biopsy? And I think this is one of the most challenging aspects for a general practitioner that is faced with who has a patient coming in with an oral tumor. What I would have to say about that is the decision on whether to do an incisional first or go right to an excisional biopsy is case by case based on the size, based on the location, the character of the mass, the rate of growth or regrowth if it you know was previously developed, radiographic findings, and then just you know a discussion with the owner regarding which risks they are more comfortable with. And I'd have to say, so excisional biopsies, very common. So just shaving off the mass based on the x-rays, they should include the tooth or bones, you know, in, in cases of, for example, those acanthomatous amyloblastomas, they're very locally invasive. You might want to remove any tissue that you think, you know, looks suspicious or affected by this tumor. So I think the more tissue you remove, the more chances that maybe this procedure will be curative for that patient. But I would say that excisional biopsies are typically less recommended. So as soon as you have a doubt, incisional biopsies also make a lot of sense. And the reason behind that is that excisional biopsies Sometimes they can be a little more challenging, but what happens is that when you remove the mass, the oral mucosa can heal very quickly and the removal site may no longer be visible by the time the histopath results are received. And obviously this can be less than ideal when wide tumor resections or radiation treatments are recommended. But, you know, again, there are some advantages of doing excisional biopsies. Of course, they can minimize anesthesia. So for dogs that are poor anesthetic candidates, minimize surgery, minimize post-operative recovery, and obviously costs, which, you know, can be a huge factor for our owners. I love that answer. I feel like in general, you just kind of made me feel better about the fact that I do struggle with this when I see these. Because sometimes I feel, I'm like, am I not getting the message here? Am I wrong for struggling with this decision about incisional versus excisional? And, you know, in particular, I mentioned the fibromas going after this tooth or not. So it's nice to know that there's some shades of gray there. And it's not always yes, take it or don't take it. And you have to take a lot of factors into consideration and go case by case. Sure. Absolutely. You mentioned excisional versus incisional. Let's talk about some biopsy techniques when we are sampling these. I, I always struggle with, if I am going to do an incisional, are there, are there masses where maybe that's not a good idea to do incisional and we really should aim for an excisional right off the bat. And if we, if we do an incisional, how big of a piece do we need? What what kind of guidelines do you have as far as how to biopsy these masses? Yeah, so in most cases, I think that incisional biopsies are appropriate. The excisional biopsies are still something that based on patient safety requires obviously multiple anesthesias if we go through this incisional route. It's just really this discussion with the client, but I do think that incisional makes sense in most cases. And that is really what is most recommended, at least by dentistry and our surgeons overall and and radiation oncologists as well, because they are obviously very involved in the post-operative care of these patients. And so I would encourage people to do incisional biopsies as much as possible. But obviously it can be challenging to do an incisional biopsy and to get, you know, a good representative sample of of the mass. And so what I would say is it's very appropriate to take more than one biopsy, and that is to maximize the likelihood of getting a diagnosis. I would say that I wouldn't expect to get a good diagnosis from one, two or three millimeter punch biopsy. The more material you can send, the better the yield. And so I'd encourage people to be bold about using, you know, large punch biopsies, but of course, if the tissue will accommodate it. 
And then it's also very important to avoid, you know, very inflamed or infected areas as much as possible. What I would recommend is just kind of going straight in the oral cavity, take the biopsy directly from the mass. And sometimes, you know, I think it's appropriate to do the biopsy in the central portion of the mass, and that's kind of to avoid disrupting or contaminating normal tissue, essentially. In terms of the instruments, using appropriate instruments, I think, is also key to have a good representative sample. And so things like sharp biopsy punches of multiple sizes, you know, ranging between four and 10 millimeters, whichever is most appropriate for the patient and the size of the mass. Sharp scissors, or I use 11 blades to remove the biopsies and then fine tooth forceps to handle the tissue. And that is to, you know, minimize crushing injury. Sometimes we may be inclined of using laser or cautery for small biopsies, but I wouldn't recommend using those tools. And that is just because laser or cautery can cause artifacts or damage the cells, and that can prevent ultimately achieving a diagnosis. And sometimes those laser and cauteries can also affect the margin interpretation for mass removal, so that can make it a little tricky. There are masses in the mouth that are very, very firm. So those that, you know, arise from the bone potentially. So firm masses that arise from maxilla or mandible, they can be very challenging to biopsy with a wedge or a punch biopsy. And so sometimes what we can do when we're faced with oral tumors that are just very challenging is do some x-rays, for example, and that can kind of plan, you can help plan your biopsy approach with a jam sheety needle the needle we use for bone biopsies in general, if we think the bone is involved. And then, of course, you know, doing an incisional biopsy comes with the risks of bleeding. So how do we control the bleeding? Well, digital pressure can be applied to control the bleeding. Sometimes you can cauterize or use hemostatic products like absorbable gel sponge or powders. In Masses that are potentially too firm or too friable to place a suture, then these wounds or these biopsy sites can or should be allowed to heal by second intention. And that's, of course, why it's so tempting sometimes to use that cautery to remove masses because it really minimizes the bleeding. You're like, oh, look, it's gone and the mouth looks so pretty and it's going to heal so fast. But stay away from that temptation is what you're saying. Yes, stay away. You talk to any pathologist and they tell you, well, you know, there's too much artifact in this sample. And it happens. It really happens. Sometimes, you know, it's just like you say, it's tempting. And the mouth, it's an area that bleeds a lot. There are ways to control the bleeding without using those instruments. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. And certainly I didn't even think about the bony masses because usually those I'm pretty intimidated by if I see them, but great advice on biopsying those as well that I think really makes that available to general practitioners to get good samples of those tumors. All right. So let's say we take the incisional biopsy approach, like you said, and we, we take a sample, we send it off, we find out what this mass is. And obviously speaking in very general terms here, because this is going to change based on the type of tumor, but it comes back and it says you need more tissue. We want an excisional biopsy here. Are there any kind of general recommendations that you would have in that case of margins, associated teeth, and things along those lines? Yes. You know, it comes down to taking as much tissue as possible. So at least, you know, basic recommendations of at least one centimeter of adjacent normal tissue, and that includes soft tissue and bone, which I think is fine. Even if it comes back as a benign mass, you know, as long as you don't create problems for primary closure with sutures. But at least based on your exam, based on the x-rays, as much tissue as you think is safe and feasible to remove. And hopefully if that comes back as a benign mass, it could also be a curative treatment for that patient. Sure. And does that usually, when you say take as much tissue as possible, does that usually extend to the alveolar bone and the teeth and, and things as well? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. any associated teeth, bone, and of course we all have our, our limits and what we feel comfortable with. 
of course, they can be challenging surgeries, consulting with dentistry. So we do have specialists in dentistry who are readily available to help or advise or even perform those those surgeries if it comes down to more of the need of this aggressive approach. And I think that's a great reminder about potential referral to a veterinary dentist or or other surgical specialist in this arena, because even as somebody who I remove a lot of teeth, I feel very comfortable removing teeth. When we get these large amounts of tissue that need to be removed, it's, it's intimidating. Like sometimes I, I look at those and I go, I don't know if I, sure. I'm really up to the task of taking this on. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And even if you suspect more of a benign mass, a lot of clients are happy that it's as safe as possible for their own pet. But at the same time, again, it's a discussion with the owner about, you know, risks and complications and and things like that. Sure, sure. Absolutely. When you get a referral from a general practitioner, what is something you wish that all of us general practitioners knew or something we did prior to referral? The more info we have, the better we can prepare the owner on treatment recommendation and costs. And so things that can be done prior to referral, but again, it can also be done at time of referral. You know, there's a lot of things that oncologists or dentists can do as well, but things like documenting tumor dimensions. A lot of general practitioners who do dentistry are comfortable doing dental radiographs or potentially some CTs. I feel like we have a lot of our patients referred in clinics that that do sometimes have CTs, but other things like staging, if that is something that can potentially change an owner's mind about pursuing referral. So things like lymph node aspirates, if we think that the dog, for example, has a large pigmented mass you know, clinical judgments, we say, oh, this looks like melanoma. So lymph node aspirates to document whether there could be metastatic disease or not. Chest x-rays. If there is signs of metastatic disease on chest x-rays, maybe some clients won't elect further treatment recommendations from the specialist. So sometimes, you know, again, just good documentation, some staging tests can be helpful. And then trying to get a definitive diagnosis. Although most biopsies were able most of the time to achieve a diagnosis, sometimes there are tumors, they're just poorly differentiated or the cells, they just look like everything and anything. And sometimes we do need to submit additional diagnostic tests like histochemistry to try to help identify what the tumor type is. Sometimes, you know, those melanomas, they can be a little tricky. They can look like sarcomas and things like that. And so doing IHC prior, if that's the recommendation from the pathologist on the biopsy report, can help accelerate things when patients are referred, because that can obviously change recommendations in terms of of definitive treatment. And I think that's a good reminder too, of how much we are actually able to complete some of this workup in general practice, which of course our clients appreciate, because like you said, sometimes we might find something that may change their mind and they say, no, referral might not be the right option for my pet, but also from a business standpoint, of course, making sure that we're working up to our fullest potential in general practice as well, both from a medical standpoint and from a business standpoint. I think that's a great reminder of just how much we can really do before we actually send these guys for referral. Yeah. And again, I want people to know that, you know, a lot of these tests sometimes can also be done in a referral center. And so either way, it's just sometimes it just helps to have a clearer picture. And I think it just comes down to trying to get this patient to treatment as much as possible, because we know those malignant tumors, they can grow very rapidly, affect the patient's quality of life, because most of the time we diagnose them in end stage disease. And so it just helps us to kind of get things going as quickly as possible possible. Sure. So uh, of course, you know, we do all these diagnostics ahead of time with your guidance and, and good reminding of just how many diagnostics we can get done prior to referral. But eventually, let's say we have this patient and we say, okay, we've got our answer. We're going to go ahead and refer. And of course, when we call you guys and we say, hey, we're sending sending this patient your way, it's going to be difficult to know what exactly you have on your hands until you can see that pet see the mass, talk to the owner and and get all these additional details. 
but are there items we can include in our medical record that will give you a better idea of what you're getting into before that pet actually gets there? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Photos are by far the most useful thing to have. So just digital photos of the mass. And that is especially if the patient, again, is, is referred to us because it can help understand one, how, what did the mass look like and where was it located? And that can be helpful to plan for radical surgery or radiation therapy. The mouth heals super, super quick. And so a few days after surgery, sometimes we're not even able to see a scar. So it can make it very challenging to know exactly where that tumor was. So with photos, we're kind of able to better see what it looked like, its size, what tissues were affected. So good photos and as much as the description as possible. So the appearance, was it ulcerated? Was it smooth? Was it fleshy? The dimensions and again, the, the exact location. And I was thinking about that earlier when you said you might do what turns out to be an incisional biopsy and just take this mass off of the gum line and then find out you need to remove more, but you can't actually see where you removed the first mass. So having those photos would, I would imagine, be, of course, useful in the case of referral, but also even for a patient that you're going to keep in-house, if you were to need to go back and get more tissue having a good idea of what that mass looked like initially could be really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm terrible about taking photos. So you're full of just really good reminders that I clearly needed to hear today. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk treatment a little bit. And of course, with the understanding that every tumor is different, every patient is different, every situation is different. So we're not going to have a one size fits all type of treatment option. But could you remind us of some of the common treatment options for oral tumors aside from removal? Yeah. So aside from removal, I just want to, you know, obviously I want to stress that local control is the most important thing. So it really is the key to successful management of those oral tumors, whether that means surgery or radiation therapy. And I guess, I, I don't know about you, Cassie, but I've had a lot of clients ask us, you know, just a very common question is, is it possible to remove the tumor at its base instead of doing a more radical surgery like mandubulectomy or maxillectomy? And the challenge is that those larger and more vascular tumors are rarely amenable to debulking since the cut surface of kind of the debulked area typically doesn't regain normal epithelial coverage. And that can lead to subsequent, you know, bleeding and secondary bacterial infections. And so obviously can impact quality of life. So that's just something that I wanted to kind of put out there because there's a lot of owners who ask that, of course, maxillectomy and mandibulectomies, you know, they sound scary for a lot of owners, but just cutting the mass off at its base is not typically recommended. So I just kind of wanted to, to put it out there. But in instances where surgery is not feasible, accessible, and honestly is not wanted by every owner, there are a few options available other than surgery. So there's radiation therapy. There are some tumors like oral melanomas that are highly responsive to radiation therapy in the macroscopic setting. You know, RT can definitely help shrink and delay the growth of, of multiple tumors and help improve the pet's quality of life for sometimes it's several weeks to months, a few months. That's what we're trying to achieve. There's electrochemotherapy that's been reported in the literature for non-resectable diseases, or it is a type of local control. Electrochemotherapy, what it is, it's essentially a technique that involves administering chemotherapy locally. And so injecting chemo in the, in the tumor and then applying an electric current on top of the tumor, and that helps facilitate the chemo entering and killing the cells. But honestly, it's not something that I have experience with in the mouth area, nor I don't know of many people who would venture into doing that. But I know it's been reported, so I'm just kind of putting it out there. But, interesting, interesting. Yeah. 
So one word on chemotherapy, because I think that a lot of pet owners who are faced with their dogs are diagnosed with cancer, they may not want to do surgery, but they ask about chemotherapy, whether that could be helpful in that setting or not. Chemotherapy is a systemic treatment to kill cancer cells that metastasize. But it's not widely used for oral tumors because oral tumors, it comes down to local disease progression rather than metastasis. And local disease progression, you know, bulky tumors, chemotherapy is not something I would hope would do much. However, in instances of melanoma, so oral melanomas, I don't know if you've come across or I mean, you've probably heard about the melanoma vaccine which, you know, typically we'll use after the tumor has been removed. So using that vaccine in the microscopic setting, but it has definitely been reported. So responses have been reported in dogs with macroscopic tumors. So visible oral melanomas, you give them the vaccine and the tumor can shrink. So that's definitely has been reported. That is in a small subset of dogs. Okay. But it is still considered as a palliative therapy in those dogs with advanced disease in which surgery may not be a good option. The vaccine, it's a series of vaccines initially, and the the initial response to the vaccine can usually take up to two months, which, of course, sometimes that span of time may be too long for dogs with advanced disease, unfortunately. But it is an option for oral melanomas. In general, if all the treatments I've just mentioned are not an option, treatment of oral tumors is mainly focused on quality of life with pain medications. I would recommend an NSAID, not corticosteroids, and then other analgesic drugs, you know, opioids or any other things that could help us with, you know, a multimodal pain approach prescribing some antibiotics, potentially, if there's evidence of secondary bacterial infections and ulcerated tissues. And then I think it comes down to discussing humane euthanasia with owners when quality of life, you know, drops below an acceptable level. Absolutely. And that actually dovetails perfectly into what I was going to ask you next. As far as prognosis, I was going to give a little shout out to the University of Florida because I was going to say, yes, I've absolutely heard of the the melanoma vaccine because I'm from the University of Florida. Yeah. And I have a colleague who I think her dog actually just got it recently. Fortunately, like very early stage disease, and it doesn't appear to be aggressive at this point. So we'll see how how all of that plays out. Hopefully for the best, it's looking good so far. But certainly what you talked about with quality of life, just like anything, that's our our overall goal is we want to maintain a good quality of life for as long as possible. So I I love that you brought up palliative options. In general, what kind of prognosis are we looking at for quality of life and and longevity in these guys? Yeah, absolutely. The, The general rule, the longest survival times that we see in these patients are dogs that we've been able to get good local control. And the outcomes will also depend on tumor type. And, you know, prior to kind of talking about those malignant tumors, what to expect, I just wanted to briefly mention that although benign oral tumors are understandably less scary and they are often more treatable than malignant tumors, they still have to be treated promptly. Even benign oral tumors can often continue to grow. And if they're not treated, they can eventually lead to difficulty eating and chewing and destruction of local tissues. I think prognosis for those benign tumors, very good, can be curative with surgery. But again, it's important to address them promptly. Of course, some owners elect for monitoring, so regular, you know, oral exams to monitor, make sure that they're not getting any bigger, but prognosis can be quite good for benign tumors. For malignant tumors, prognosis varies by the type of tumor, the size of the tumor, and then the stage of the tumor, which means, you know, how extensive it is, is has it had time to spread elsewhere in the body? So all of those factors will be taken into account in terms of what the prognosis could be for those patients. I would say that in general, the more caudal in the mouth the lesion is located, the poorer the prognosis. 
lesions in the rostral part of the mandible or maxilla or the rostral half of the tongue carry a much better prognosis. But if I talk about our three main malignant oral tumors in dogs, starting with oral malignant melanoma, that tumor is locally invasive and it spreads to the local lymph nodes and the lungs in over 70% of cases. And so you can imagine that the prognosis is, you know, guarded to poor for these types of tumors, unless it's diagnosed and excised prior to metastatic disease, in which case, you know, good local control, whether that means aggressive, you know, radical surgery or whatnot, could provide several months to beyond a year of good quality of life. But if, unfortunately, most patients die of metastatic disease. In terms of squamous cell carcinoma, which is another common oral tumor in dogs, it depends on where it's located in the mouth. Squamous cell carcinomas that are in the rostral part of the oral cavity typically is unlikely to metastasize. It's more so in terms of, you know, the invasiveness of that tumor. And I think that surgical excision can sometimes help achieve good local control. And the prognosis is actually pretty good with more than a year of good quality of life. But on the other hand, if the tumor is located in caudal regions of the mouth or affect the tonsils, metastasis is more likely. And then we typically talk about the needs of radiation and chemotherapy for those tumors. And so you can kind of expect that the prognosis is obviously not as good. And so sometimes it can be hard, depending on its location, how do we think this tumor will behave? And so, you know, mean survival times that have been reported or anything from a few months, eight, nine months to over a year, two years of good quality of life. And then lastly, one of the most common oral tumors, fibrosarcomas, that tumor is recognized as the tumor with the highest recurrence rate. And so the type of therapy pursued will definitely affect, it's one of the predictors of survival time for these dogs. So the type of therapy pursued, its location, the size at time of diagnosis, and then of course, different things on the biopsy report, like margins and grade and things like that. But survival times similarly to squamous cell carcinomas. It's anything that ranges from a few months of good quality of life to several, you know, over a year to two years, if we're able to get good local control, which again is the most important thing for those oral tumors. Absolutely. I feel like just fibrosarcomas in general tend to be kind of aggressive recurrent things. Yeah, they can be, they definitely can be nasty. And because they're typically located in the caudal portion of the mouth, like the maxilla, sometimes it's definitely more challenging in terms of, you know, treatment recommendations and surgeries. I mean, I think there are options, but it doesn't come without risks and complications and things like that. So it can certainly be challenging. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Garrow, it's always hard to talk about cancer in our pets. I have my dog is sleeping here next to me. And as we're talking about this, I'm like, oh gosh, like it's just, it's so hard to think about it, but I'm so glad that we have people like you out there who are helping to get control of these tumors and helping us as general practitioners to do a better job with our patients, to give them the longevity and the quality of life as best we can. So thank you so much for joining me and for all the information today. Oh, you're very welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Did we answer everyone's burning questions about canine oral tumors? All of us are going to go out and feel a little more confident the next time we encounter one of these masses. Dr. Garrow, thank you so much for your insight and all of the excellent information. Thank you to Hills for sponsoring this episode. And of course, to all of you for joining us. For more episodes like this, click on the Education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day. Mm-hmm.